With these rules in mind, if Monster Collection had a weakness at launch, it was that there was way too much to learn. Not only did every aspect of its system diverge from the formula established by Magic, but the particular nuances regarding timing and effect use could be overwhelming, and the card pool itself was gigantic from the outset. The base set alone had 362 cards in its set list, which was as many cards as Pokémon had put out in its entire first two years on the market. This was a massive amount of content to learn and master, and it was followed by seven major expansions. Moreover, players didn't have long to figure out the card pool. SNE and Fujimi Shobo began hosting organized play for the game almost immediately, beginning with the Fujimi Dragon Conventions in Osaka and Tokyo, held November 16th and 24th, just two months after Monkole's launch. This was followed by the Monster Collection Fair in April 1998 and the first formal competitive tournaments for the game on July 5th of that year, a 62-person tournament hosted at card shop Pangaya. The first All Japan National Championship took place August 30th, and from this point on, Group SNE would host nationals every year in August until 2007, when nationals began to be held more loosely between July and November. Even in the game's otherwise dead years, when no new expansions were being put out and no manufacturer held the license like 2005 to 2007 or 2015 to 16, SNE continued to host the annual national championships. Having started out as a tabletop RPG company, they were accustomed to supporting products that hadn't been updated in years and didn't need to be. Their loyalty to their fanbase was rewarded, as many of the early competitive players continued to remain involved with the game for decades to come. For example, the winner of the second Fujimi Dragon Dragon Convention, Misasagi Shinogu, became an influential blogger in the Monster Collection community in the late 90s and early 2000s. Monster Collection was the game that started an enduring practice of recognizing players under pseudonyms rather than real names, and Misasagi was no exception. He ran the website Ryukakugaku, or The Dragonhorn School, where he published strategy articles on Monkole, and later began publishing on his personal blog Ryukakute Shoten Sui Tocho, or Dragonhorn Bookstore Receipt Log. In the social media age, Misasagi continued to network with the Monkole community on Twitter and was joined by other longtime competitive players like national champion Wai Kura, runner up Rui Rui, and second national champion Kozuchi. Unfortunately, none of Misasagi's strategy articles seem to have survived to the present day, as the Internet Archive was not able to incorporate a working version of Ryokaku Gaku, and many of the key figures in the Monkole community have withdrawn from public life on the Internet after issues with harassment and infighting, deleting their social media profiles entirely. Because of the huge scope of the game, and the much more incomplete record on its history, it's impractical to talk about it in the exact same way I did Pokémon. Many of the game's cards are only accounted for by fan wikis compiling their effect text, so we don't even have scans of some of them that could confirm exactly what they did, and there are very few records of what early tournament decks looked like. Moreover, the game itself only had a brief period of popularity lasting from late 1997 to 2000. The original line of Monster Collection sets included seven big releases. The base set Booster and Starter Pack, the Inheritance of Ancient Empires and Magician's Apocalypse Boosters, Duelists of the Sacred City pre-constructed beginner's decks, and the advent of the Aerial Garden, Guardians of the Golden Tree, and Awakening of the Sun King expansions. Six months after the final booster set, the game relaunched as Monster Collection 2 in September 2000. Although Monkole 2 cards were compatible with the original game on a technical level, the official tournament rules adopted by SNE and Fujimi Shobo in their sanctioned tournaments were called S-Regulation, and forbid any cards from before Awakening of the Sun King from being used in competitive play. S-Regulation tournaments instantly alienated the game's established audience. Many players quit Monster Collection at this point, with the older audience going over to Broccoli's Aquarian Age and younger players either returning to Pokémon or jumping ship to Yu-Gi-Oh! The game itself continued to see new expansions until 2004, but lost favor with Japan's Legion of Hobby Shops, and we can see this reflected in the archives of Card Shop Pangaea's online event listings. In September 1999, Pangaea was hosting 11 Monster Collection events a month, with weekly 32-person 100 yen tournaments at 4pm every Wednesday and 400 yen booster drafts at 6. By June 2000, they were hosting none. Recall that Pangaea was one of the original hobby shops to import English Magic the Gathering cards in Japan, which helped kickstart the trading card business in the country. In the late 90s, Pangaea had become one of the biggest stores in Osaka, and its players hard-dropped Monster Collection as soon as the regulations kicked in. This puts Pokémon's own decision to begin a set rotation in 2003 in a slightly different light. 
TPC had the preceding example of SNE and Fujimi Shobo that showed them exactly what would happen if they went through with their plans, and they still went and pulled that trigger. But while Pokemon was able to ultimately weather the change and continue to survive on a much smaller scale, Moncole never quite recovered. The game was completely out of print between 2005 and 7, and in 2008 production rights were transferred from Fujimi Shobo to Broccoli, the owner and manufacturer of the Lee Fight, Aquarian Age, Lise, and Dimension Zero trading card games. Broccoli rebooted Moncole as the Monster Collection trading card game and introduced the G Regulation tournament format for exclusive use with cards printed in their expansions, while trying to jumpstart its heart by cross promoting the game with Dimension Zero. But Broccoli's Monster Collection died out quickly. The license was bought up in August 2011 by Bushiroad, then producer of Vice Schwarz, Victory Spark, Character Operating System, Alice Cross, and Cardfight Vanguard. Bushiroad managed to keep Moncole going until June 2015, when they chose not to renew their license, and continued to offer support for organized play until May 2016. SNE then attempted to revive the game themselves, with two 20th anniversary sets launched in March 2017 that pandered to its adult audience, and later launched a 2018 board game titled Moncole Deck Building Elemental Storm. But none of these strategies were financially successful, and the company is now pushing a new initiative titled Monster Collection Deus, which imitates Fantasy Flight Games' living card game model. Deus includes four copies of every card in its base set set list, so you don't have to buy individual cards or open randomized booster packs to play. Deus launched in May 2019, with no word of if or when an expansion to its base set will follow. Whether or not this strategy will pay off for SNE remains to be seen, but at this time, the official Twitter account has less than 300 followers, and I'm one of them. The future does not look bright for the game. Although Monster Collection is almost unheard of in the Western world, in Japan it was the second most popular TCG of the 90s after Pokemon, and had a long-lasting impact on the Japanese hobby industry. The most obvious was its influence on the weekly Yu-Gi-Oh! manga, which, three months after Moncole came out, entered its Duelist Kingdom arc, where it revisited the fan-favorite card game Magic and Wizards, what we today know as Duel Monsters. Although it took several weeks for the full game mechanics of Duelist Kingdom to be detailed, the special rules used in this arc of the manga seem to reflect author Takahashi Kazuki's personal experience with Moncole. Just as terrain cards define Monster Collection's gameplay, and the field could be made up of numerous terrains that each player's units occupied, Duelist Kingdom incorporated environments into the battlefield where monsters would receive power bonuses for standing on terrain of the same attribute and the tabletop-inspired dice rolls and initiative checks of Monster Collection likewise seemed to have an effect on how Magic and Wizards was played out in the manga. Monsters in Duelist Kingdom would receive percentage bonuses not just from the field but from the card effects themselves, like Pump King the King of Ghosts increasing the power of zombie monsters by 10% every turn. Other card effects like Time Wizard seemingly required dice rolls to simulate effectively. In fact, preventing the opponent from using ritual spells and counter spells by replacing their stone circle with a terrain of your own, or forcing them to discard high-level monsters by using change field to replace a terrain with a lower limit one sounds exactly like the kind of thing Yugi would do, similar to how he burned away in Sector Haga's forest field to eliminate the field power bonus on Cocoon of Evolution, or how he stopped Mako's monster hiding effect by destroying the moon to lower the tide. And while in earlier chapters Magic and Wizards had the same kind of freeform card placement as Magic the Gathering, Duelist Kingdom introduced an 8x5 grid cards were placed upon that was superficially similar to Moncole's 3x4 grid. This was later condensed into the five monster and five magic trap zones for each player when Konami adapted Yu-Gi-Oh! into a real game two years later. The newly introduced trap cards drew both from Magic's counter spells and Moncole's ritual spell counters, and the equip magic cards that featured so prominently in Duelist Kingdom were likely inspired by Moncole's equip item cards. But the influence didn't extend just to Yu-Gi-Oh! The mechanic of drawing up or down to your maximum hand size every turn later influenced Bandai's 1999 Digital Monster card game, and the Guardians of the Golden Tree booster set later introduced the Summoner Rules, an alternate rule set in which both players set a Summoner card as their avatar at the start of the game, which would later influence Cardfight Vanguard's Vanguard mechanic more than a decade later. This was also Japan's first TCG to use icons to indicate an effect's timing. Magic and Pokemon simply wrote out their timings in plain text, but Moncole had four icons indicating abilities that resolved from hand, at a specific timing, in the main phase, or by tapping the user. This idea would later influence Vice Schwarz and Cardfight Vanguard's separation of skills into automatic, continuous, and activated effects, among other games. But if Monster Collection was so influential on the industry, 
Why has it failed so often and so regularly? The game clearly has a dedicated core base that's stuck by it through Monster Collection 2, through Broccoli's Monster Collection, through the Bushiroad era, and even into Deus, but it failed to expand beyond that core fan base that picked it up in 1997. Fujimi Shobo tried to breathe fresh life into it by commissioning Studio Dean to create the Rokumon Tengai Monkole Knight spin-off in January 2000. Rather than an entry into the Rokumon Sekai Six Gates World franchise, Monkole Knights was part of its own continuity, the Six Gates Zenith series. Similar to Shin Megami Tensei's Devil Children spin-off, the Tengai subseries was made to target a younger demographic that would presumably outgrow the spin-off and transition into the core series targeted at adolescents and adults. Or so the theory went. Things got weird when Monkole Knights was picked up by Sabin and Fox Kids during the early 2000s anime craze. Spurred on by the success of 90s series like Sailor Moon and Dragon Ball Z, dubbed anime localized on shoestring budgets were replacing American animation on many of the traditional children's broadcast channels, and Monkole Knights was part of another wave of dubs Fox was bringing in, featuring the likes of Digimon, Escaflone, Monster Rancher, Flint the Time Detective, and Metabots. Like many of the post-Pokemon localizations, it wasn't really a thought-out move on the part of studios or networks. Monkole Nights in Japan was part of a bigger franchise, and used to drive sales of the Monkole Kids trading cards, with the aim of eventually upgrading kids into the actual Monster Collection TCG. But in America, all of these shows were used simply to drive up ratings and rake in advertising money, with no actual long-term game plan. This was at the very end of the Renaissance age of Western animation, but the Renaissance was something that primarily touched movie theaters, not broadcast cartoons. Many of the American animated shows airing at this time were essentially low-budget illustrated radio, constrained by post-He-Man regulations on the content of children's programming blocks, and kids were drawn in by the higher quality, action-oriented work being imported out of Japan. Shows like The Ripping Friends weren't doing themselves any favors in the first place by having no real target audience, but the thing that buried them was going against the likes of car Card captors airing at the same time on a different channel. Even really good shows like Jackie Chan Adventures over on Kids WB were going to struggle if Fox Kids aired Metabots in the same time slot. Just about the only way WB could win that battle was by switching Jackie Chan's time slot with Pokemon, which is exactly what they did. Ultimately, the Rokumon Tengai subseries never worked as intended either in Japan or America. Monkole Nights was a flash in the pan, and the Rokumon Sekai series didn't become the massive hit SNE intended it to be from the start. Arguably, we did see a long-term payoff in the Bushiroad era, when the Japanese children that had watched Monkole Nights were finally teenagers and young adults with disposable income, and the result was that the game lasted longer under Bushiroad than it had under any previous publisher. But there were other, more fundamental issues that made the game hard to sustain. In the first place, Monkole always suffered from a branding problem in that it conflicted with Takara Tomi's extremely popular line of Pokemon figures, also titled Monster Collection. Sharing your product name with the biggest media franchise in the world is never a good thing. Everybody knows what pocket monsters are, no one knows what monster in my pocket is. Moreover, unlike Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh!, Monster Collection never expanded itself overseas beyond the Knights anime, so it couldn't use a global audience as a buffer when it fell on hard times in its home country. And despite trying to pull kids in with the Tengai spin-off, Monster Collection singled itself out as a product strictly targeted at young adults by not having any furigana on its cards, pronunciation guides used to help younger players understand how an individual kanji is read in Japanese. So the game couldn't benefit from periphery demographics, which backfired horribly as Magic the Gathering started to gain steam with young children in 1999, following the serialization of the Duel Masters manga. In fact, the existence of magic proved to be a surprising thorn in Monkole's side throughout its many lives and rebirths. While magic in Japan never took the top spots for sales numbers until the 2019 War of the Spark expansion with its Japan-exclusive alternate artworks, it did receive a significant spike in popularity after Wizards started pushing advertisements in Koro Koro magazine. On its most basic level, the core rules and play field of Monster Collection created a very cluttered and not easily organized space, which made it inaccessible to new players. Even if you brought a new player into Monkole, they were just as likely to take notice of the other, more streamlined games being played in the same shops, and move over to those titles. Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh!, and even Magic were easier to get into and more widespread. At the same time Broccoli and Bushiroad were trying to revive the IP, they were contending with other, newer games that had learned their lessons from this one. In that sense, the world outgrew Monster Collection. And despite starting out as the second most popular TCG after Pokemon, in the end it couldn't maintain momentum and make it through its first rotation. 
In the final word, Hindsight paints Monster Collection as a game with a lot of good core design ideas and innovative elements that didn't turn out as great in execution. The dice rolls were an interesting way of increasing variance and adding a layer of unpredictability to a battle, but they were ultimately cumbersome and added extraneous pieces to the game. Moving monsters around on the field was interesting and added strategic depth, but keeping track of as many as 3-6 to six units all stacked on top of one terrain card was clunky and could even hinder proper play. However, the attempt at preserving Magic's original concept of balance between colors was a welcome contrast to Pokemon, and the lengths the game went to to reduce variance and restrict the impact of card advantage while getting players to fight sub-games over getting off their respective ritual spell cards were all welcome depth in a genre that was still finding its feet. Monster Collection was something of a growing pain for Japanese trading card games, one shared not just between SNE and Fujimi Shobo, but across the whole industry. Once its experiment was done with, the game lost its purpose, and players grew out of it. This has been Toya. Thank you for joining me today. If you liked what you saw, please consider liking and subscribing to support the channel. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Pillowfort at Toya, on Twitch at Decode Toya, and of course, right here at Maniac's channel.